The gravity of the time is such that every new avenue of peace, no matter how dimly discernible, should be explored. Never before in history has so much hope for so many people been gathered together in a single organization. You will provide a great share of the wisdom, of the courage, and the faith which can bring to this world lasting peace for all nations and happiness and well-being for all men. Juan Abenschutz Hartman, thank you so much for inviting me down to your beautiful city and your beautiful country. We're in Mexico City right now. And it is the day before Mother's Day, a very special day here. It is. <laughs> Glad so, you're here. Glad you could make it. Yes. So you've been, um, I mean, you have been an essential part of Mexican nuclear history from the beginning. And now you sit at the top of the Mexican nuclear world as the director general of the main regulatory body here. So Not I have exactly. to hear your story from the beginning. <laughs> well, it's, for me, it was very interesting. Uh, actually, I started my, my relationship with nuclear on the last year of the engineering school. I took uh, mechanical and electrical engineering at the university and uh, uh, they started some, um, how do you call them? In here they call them postgraduate. So I took one that was nuclear, nuclear engineering, principles of nuclear engineering, something like that. And I got sort of hooked. So I started doing some information digging, and I discovered that the French gave uh, some scholarships. Mm -hmm. So I got the French scholarship for a course at Saclay, the Institut de Sciences Techniques Nucléaires. And I took nuclear engineering there. I was there for a year. And then I came back. And uh, I st actually, there was one guy at the Federal Electricity Commission, which is the Mexican utility. Uh, and I came back in 60, and in 62, I joined CFE. And CFE is the big electric company. Here. It's the big electric company. State owned electric company. State owned electric company, which is right now undergoing apparently another transformation. Mm. In the past administration, the constitution was modified. Because before that, only CFE could be in the power business, except for, for private uh, generation for their own use. Mm. Uh, that was modified, and uh, it was the, the idea was to create a market, mm. like, like in many other countries. But now this new administration is going backwards. Mm. So now it's uh, the political system here the state. is a little different. It's six years, six years, one party, one person. That's it. Uh, well, historically, it has been more or less like that. But this one is a novelty even for Mexico because, because it switched parties for the first time in so many years. It is because it switched parties. The party. No, the, the first switch was in uh, two thousand. Ah, okay when Fox came in. That's uh, then the PAN, the sort of right, rightish party, uh, followed after 2006. And then the PRI came back. I see, I see. The PRI had been holding the, the, the presidency for like 70 years, I think. So they lost 
for two periods, they came back and they lost miserably. <laughs> it, it, it was the, the majority obtained by the present president was appalling. And the main reason was that the, generally the people were very much disappointed with the previous administration. A reaction. So it was definitely a reaction. Uh, like sometimes 30% of the population voted for this guy. But during the, the polls, he, he got the absolute majority, it's only 70%, or something. It's amazing. So the guy is very special and extremely powerful, of course. So he rules by, by press conferences. He has a daily press conference and he rules. But that's the, the subject of the, no. <laughs> of, Still of the interview. Well, it's interesting. But <laughs> well, take us back. That's, so that's you were, my, my opinion. You were so I went to France. I came back from France. <laughs> I joined CFE. And uh, in CFE, there was a guy who had also taken some courses from an engineer. And he did some very preliminary studies for a small nuclear power plant in the northern border. Mm. It was very preliminary, but it was interesting because uh, in, during that administration, the northern part of the country imported electricity from the US. I see. And politically, it was thought that it would be better to produce our own electricity. Interesting. Uh, of course, it, it, it would be a small plant, so it was, if I remember correctly, it was a nuclear power plant of about 30 megawatts. Okay. Which, it, it, there, there were designs, uh, at least in blackboards. Well, at any rate, um, I started working with him, and he did some minor things. Then, uh, there was an opportunity to to go to Vienna, and I went to Vienna for two years. And this was to work with the IAEA? With the IAEA, and I, I got a job at the nuclear power. In those days, it was called the Division of Nuclear Power and Reactors. And what did that division do? They, they looked into they, new types of reactors? Well, the, the, the International Atomic Energy Agency, as you know, is a... Is a is an international bureaucracy, which has an, a very important role. The one that is most cherished, particularly by the U.S., is safeguards. Safeguards. Now, and safeguards and physical security. So making sure that nothing but goes wrong with the plants that already exist. The origin, not quite. They, they, they have an important role because they, they act as a... As a I would call that uh, not, not exactly a promoter, but uh, they, they have a program for establishing uh, basic regulations, mm. which in principle uh, are accepted by all the member states, which I guess uh, is something like 190, less than the UN. But uh, lots of countries that have no nuclear power uh, are members, and some of them are active. Uh, the basic function of the agency is to implement the safeguards program. But the origin of the IAEA was the Atoms of Peace program of uh, President Eisenhower. So the, the Atoms for Peace that started in the U.S. eventually become international. And the, that was the, the aim of the IAEA, to give, to, to convert the swords into blows. Yes. Convertir las espadas en arados. Uh, so the idea was, okay, we, we are going to make sure that uh, there is no proliferation, and as, a, as the carrot of the stick, 
what we're going to do is to, to give technical assistance, mm. mainly to developing countries. And they have a very important, of, uh, a relatively important program of, of, of technical assistance, which covers work with uh, research uh, institutions of the different countries, actually financing. It is not very big, but it is substantially important enough. The division where I was uh, dealt with uh, collecting information on, on nuclear power plants and their operation, uh, giving some, some technical assistance, and uh, giving, I mean, organizing missions. Missions? What kind to of advice. In, in, in those days, I, I was part of a mission, which is an extremely interesting personal experience. I, I went to, I, I was part of a mission in, in 60, 63, I believe it was, to South Korea. Mm -hmm. And the, the mission was, the aim was to study the energy situation and look into the possibilities of implementing nuclear power. It was extremely interesting because in those days, Korea was, uh, South Korea was, was a country at war. The war hadn't finished, it, it was quiet, but uh, the, the war was still on with North Korea. And the economic situation was really bad. Really bad. I mean, the, the per capita income was about $500. Whereas in Mexico, it was about, uh, in those days, it was about 5000 of course, now Korea is like 40,000, and Mexico is like 12,000. And many people attribute their economic success to energy abundance as well. Well, and, and that was the, the interesting part of this mission, because the, situation, the energy situation was, was the, the only resource they have is coal, mm. and very bad coal at that. They had some hydro but they have no, no oil or gas whatsoever. So of course our recommendation was, you will not be able to do anything without nuclear power. <laughs> and eventually they, they started nuclear power program. They have been very successful. As, as in each country now they are beginning to have some complications because the present uh, president doesn't like nuclear. They tried to stop it, but Finally, the population was against stopping nuclear, which is an interesting phenomenon, <laughs> not, but it's the other way around. Well, at any rate, uh, that was one, one of my functions. The, the other thing that was interesting that was that, uh, because I speak French, I became good friend with the Deputy Director General for Technical Operations, mm. who was a Frenchman who was groomed to become the skipper of the first atomic, the first French atomic energy somebody. Mm. But he was displaced by a noble gentleman. In spite of the fact that he was a politician, he, he, he came from the Ecole Polytechnique, which is the top notch. The top uh, university, yeah. And uh, he had been a Marine all his life. And despite of that, he was displayed so as, as a, as a, how do you say that, a prize. So you make it, we say, regalo de, for <laughs> the Spanish also. It, it, it's a, it's a, Premio de Consolación. Mm. They, they, they got him a job at the agency, yeah. a, a very good job. And I, I, I became, I become, became good friends with him. So that's why, that's how I got to go to the mission in Korea. Mm. I was a junior uh, officer. Normally I wouldn't have gone. 
But it was okay. We, we were for two weeks in, in Korea. Uh, the other thing is, for instance, I, I, I was responsible in, for, for looking into direct energy conversion. Direct energy conversion? If you go directly from, from the source to a usable form of energy. Hmm. How does that work? Like, well, the, the, the best known examples are the photovoltaic cells. Yes. You, you take the photons and they, could, they produce electricity. And so this would be through some materials that would be able to absorb the radiation? Well, I, I got interested, even got a couple of patents on that uh, in the process, which is, you never know what will happen, but uh, this was uh, taking advantage of a phenomenon in ionized gases. In ionized gases, I see. Like, like, and where would these ionized gases sit? This would be outside the, right outside the reactor, inside the reactor? Well, no, it's, it's a completely different concept. Oh, I see. No, nothing to do with the present fusion systems, the tokamak with the plasma in the center, which I think is <coughs> a combination of lunacy <laughs> and and uh, technological interests, which that, that's a different matter. I don't think that uh, fusion reactors are ever going to operate on the on the basis of the technology that is being developed. I mean, to boil water with a source of heat and that has two million degrees is madness. <laughs> there is no other way to to describe it. But in the process of doing that, uh, they are developing all sorts of interesting uh, materials. It's mm -hmm. amazing. Of course. Because they, they, have the they have the combination of the 2 million degrees, of more than 2 million degrees of the plasma and the superconductors of the coils. Which has to be pretty close, there. yeah. They have to be pretty close and they require some very special materials that we have other applications later. Almost like the space project, you know, you go to the like moon the space and project, we get a lot of materials out of it. Like the, like the military <laughs> project, like the military program. In, in all countries, the, the technology used to kill people eventually finds its ways into practical applications, spatial uses. Computers are a good example. Yes. Had it not been for the wars, computers would be still like hand opening. <coughs> okay, so then I came back and I started working in a different uh, department and uh, we, we decided to form a, a special unit, a, a small unit. Uh, operation research was beginning to be a la mode in those days. And also, the first nuclear power plant in the U.S. was decided on, on economic grounds. Mm. So we thought that uh, we should look into it more carefully. And we did some, some not quite back of the envelope calculations, but almost. <laughs> <coughs> and it turned out that with the prices we could find in, in literature and by calling some people and all that, uh, it looked like uh, nuclear power would be competitive with power generated by fuel oil, which was the main source of, uh, of uh, for, for uh, power plants. Why wasn't it the default assumption that nuclear would be cheaper than oil-based? Given the energy density, what were the limiting factors at the time, at the start of the industry, that still made it almost not competitive? Well, the, the energy density of nuclear is so enormous that it makes it easily economically competitive. Because because of the of the size you need, 
because of the amount of material you need, because of all these things. The, the main problem with nuclear was that uh, the development of, of the first nuclear power plants in the US, but also in many other countries, was work carried out by scientists who were involved in the weapons uh, program. Mm. So the technology had to do, for instance, with uh, reactors or submarines, which is a beautiful application of nuclear power. The submarine can stay underwater for what I believe is two years or something like that. I, I, I don't think I would, I would survive <laughs> as, as a, as a, as a, <laughs> as a somebody in driver, yeah, but yeah. <laughs> it's amazing, like, like two years, boy. But people who, was in, who, who worked in that domain were mainly scientists and engineers who came from the, from the weapons industry. And they had a very special view because economic considerations were not particularly important. Mm. I mean, you need more material, you have more materials. I mean, the, the, the electrical uh, equipment of the, of the submarines, uh, I mean, the, the, the cables are uh, silver. Right. Silver is the best conductor. Money is no option when it comes no, to a submarine. Money is no no problem. <laughs> so that got into the nuclear power program at the beginning. The other thing was that at the beginning, uh, people who designed nuclear power plants were fairly confident with nuclear power plants. They, they did not take into consideration the, what I call the, the capital sin of nuclear. What is the capital sin? The bomb. The, the first application that uh, people are aware of when you talk about nuclear is the bomb. No matter what you do, the, the originally the, the the bomb was known known to the world in in 1945, and the the conventional thought was that people would forget. <coughs> by by 1950, 1955, something like that, people would no longer remember the bomb. That was definitely not the case. Today, of course, the, the school system in, in all the world, the politicians, the thinkers, educators, make sure that this is not forgotten. So when you talk with, with the general public, say nuclear, they the picture is the the the, the mushroom, the, the bomb. No, no, no doubt about it. And as a result, that's my my theory. The nuclear industry uh, the, grew up to be a very complex field, complex of complejo psychological complexes. They are, they are more afraid of, of an accident than the general public. Regardless of the fact that nuclear power plants are designed to make sure that if an accident happens, the consequences are not that big. If you take Chernobyl, Chernobyl is a different story. Right. Chernobyl was a plutonium producing facility and to consider that's a power plant, it's a misnomer. It's, that's not a power plant. No. Uh, the same as wind scale, that had a very bad accident, which fortunately has been forgotten. 
and which wasn't too bad. Yes. The guy who designed that, uh, that plant, uh, I knew him from conferences and stuff like that. And I think we would have a, we went to, we went for a drink or, or have dinner or something. And we had a very nice talk. And he told me, <laughs> he really didn't think that it was really necessary. But just in case, he, he equipped the windscape plant with uh, activated carbon filters. And what happened in, in Winscale was that uh, people were not aware of the Wigner effect in, in graphite. It simply didn't, that which, hadn't happened. Which effect is it? It's, it's, it's like the, the bombardment with neutrons of the, of ah, the, how of the, the carbon changes the structure. Yes. And if the temperature reaches a certain limit, it becomes, it, it, the energy contained by displacement of the crystals is released. So you get a peak of, of uh, heat, which started the ignition of the, <laughs> of the, of the pile of the moderator of the, of the reactor. And there was a big fire and fortunately, the, the activated carbon filters trapped the iodine, which is the, the yes. it's a fission product and it's very So iodine, very iodine is the fission product that we have to worry about in terms of hazard to human health. You, well, it's, it's not that simple. <laughs> <coughs> the reactors are designed to trap the, the fission products. Gaseous, liquid, and solid. And this is the famous theory of the multiple barriers. You have the fuel itself, the pellets, you have the zirconium tubes, which can be uh, stainless steel. Or then you have the reactor, and then you have the building around the reactor, and then you have depending on different kinds of regulations, uh, the building that will withstand the crash of a, of a large airplane and, and still maintain its integrity. And then after Fukushima, they, they came up with something that was a solution that was already uh, suggested, which was the direct vent Filter then or direct vent because if things <laughs> things that were not supposed to happen happen, right. you may you it, it is better to release the pressure from the right. containment building than to let it blow up. Why I <clears throat> this is something I never understood about the defense in depth theory mm -hmm. itself is why making something airtight is important to restrict the flow of radionuclides. It seems to me when you make something airtight, it is always worse. That's how like a pressure cooker when, is made, you know, bomb is made. Why is airtight good? It, it seems to me like every is, system should always have releases and let pressure dissipate. Well, you were not alone because many people started <laughs> saying that, okay, it is good to have it tight, provided it doesn't fail. And this is why the politics, the, 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 the problem with the, with the main circuits is not really that important. You have steel of uh, you know, 10 inches thick, which is the stand for everything. But in case something breaks, you have the containment building. And the containment building is very big. So you design it for a relatively low pressure. And you make sure it is airtight. But because increasing the pressure of the, of the containment building beyond its uh, limits could blow it up, there's something you don't want to happen. So you need a relief valve, yes. as you have in the primary circuits. So all, all airtight uh, systems must have a blow valve, a release valve, a safety valve. So this concept 
was, for instance, boiling water reactors have uh, a pressure, uh, sort of a condenser inside the, the reactor. So if the steam from the main system blows, it blows into water and it's condensed. Mm -hmm. So that the pressure in the containment doesn't, doesn't grow too much. In spite of that, uh, it has now been ruled that, that uh, containment systems, containment buildings must have uh, a pressure valve. And there are some, some many other things that have been coming as a result of, of uh, mainly Fukushima. Yes. Which again, as, as all accidents in nuclear, all of them are a demonstration of success. And they are blamed for all sorts of things that are not true. <laughs> but well, uh, uh, let yeah. me go back to my <laughs> idea about uh, design. So what happened was that everything, for, for, for a while, everything was all right. I mean, people liked nuclear. There were some interesting uh, accidents with public relations. Uh, a guy from General Electric told me that he was responsible for, for public uh, for the press. propaganda yeah, the press. Right. And they, they run into a very special thing, which is probably specific to the US, I'm not so sure. Uh, the, the story goes that uh, the company was going to build the nuclear power plant. In, 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 the, in the field, outside of, of cities, relatively far away from cities. So the story goes that this group from the utility goes to visit, how did they call the, well, a couple, a mid-age couple that lives with the kids in a ranch house. In the farm in a barn, farm, farm. And they say, look, we are from the electric utility. We're going to build a nuclear power plant two miles from here in, in that direction of that. And uh, want you to know that this is a, an extremely safe installation. Nothing is going to be wrong. The design, and they, they explain the whole theories. They leave, and then the wife says to the husband, "Say, Joe, they, they, they have a refinery here. Wolves next door. Nobody came from the refinery to tell us that the refinery was so sure and, and so so safe that nothing was ever going to happen to us. These people, I, I, I don't trust them. Why, why, why do they have to tell us that it's very safe? If, if it is safe, go on and build it, and, and there'll be no problem. That's right. So that's one of the things that hits, particularly in the in the U.S. It was very bad. The, the, the reaction was a reaction of mistrust. First, because the nuclear scientists started selling nuclear as too cheap to meter. And too safe to worry about. Nothing could ever happen. It's then, almost like actions speak louder than words. Them going there to visit and well, saying it's safe has it's, more powerful effect than the words absolutely. that come out of their mouth. And there is another thing that's very important. If you want to project confidence, you have to act with confidence. And if you remember, we, you were not born in, in, in Three Mile Island, but the reaction of Three Mile Island was an absolute shame. It's unbelievable. Yes. Instead of objectively explaining what was happening, there were all sorts of idiotic reactions. Nuclear power was dead. The the. I think the, the NRC did not exist. It was the Atomic Energy Commission. But at any rate, they, 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 they started. The guy responsible for the safety of reactors 
invented the hydrogen bubble. He was not an engineer, but he decided that there, must, there, there could be a hydrogen bubble, and if that combined with oxygen, the plant would blow and uh, fission products would be distributed evenly all across the state of Pennsylvania. It's, it's a shame because the, the plant itself did not uh, harm anybody, not even the operators. Nobody received a higher dose than the, than the normal levels yeah. for the general public, not for operating personnel. It's funny because... And the reaction was a reaction of such lack, lack of, of uh, self-trust that they did kill nuclear in the U.S. The net result was there were more cancellations. It was almost the nuclear industry itself. It did, was the nuclear industry. That did the damage to itself. Well, from public perception perspective. In the, from the perception point of view, well, I can give you an, another example that is very to the point. Normally, vendors, nuclear power plant vendors, Westinghouse, General Electric, in those days, Combustion Engineering, Babcock, and the foreigners, all would, would have a sales pitch based on economics and on the characteristics of nuclear. The density of, of uh, the, the fission reaction is so big that all the all the, the irradiated material could be kept in a room of the size of this room for 30 years for operation of a 1,000 megawatt plant. The transport of the material, if you compare it with coal, that in the U.S. it was the the adversary, not the the concurrence. You have to compete with coal. And coal was much cheaper, of course. So the net result was because the industry felt that they had to do every time more. What they transmitted was a sense of insecurity. If the nuclear community invented the concept of an inherently safe reactor. It was the nuclear people. It was uh, one of the Wigner or Wiener, I don't know. Who, an idiot. What's, there is no such thing as an uh, intrinsically safe plane or power plant or automobile or I see. And by telling the public over and over again, by trying to sell your plants on intrinsically safe, intrinsically safe, you scare no, no, people no, no, into no, thinking... No, 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 no. I was talking the story. Originally, the sales were made on the basis of the characteristics of the plant. With Three Mile Island, this, the main message started to shift a little bit. After Chernobyl, in spite of the fact that Chernobyl was not a nuclear power plant, it started shifting to safety. If now you're invited to a, to a sales presentation from any of the vendors, is safety. Safety, they are not using the word intrinsically safe. But what I'm telling you is that as part of the complexes of industry, they do things like the intrinsically safe reactor, the accident tolerant reactor, which is a very bad concept also, not as bad as the intrinsically safe reactor. But why, why do we have the need to invent these things? It's, it's a, it's a, that's a very interesting sociological phenomenon. Normal people have been aware of nuclear 
because of the bomb. And then you have the scientists who show, not the scientists, I'm sorry, the, the nuclear industry, because it comprises everything, that, that show a lack of, of, of self, uh, confidence. self-confidence, which is amazing. And when you tell a salesperson, why, why, why do you pitch safety? Pitch operational characteristics, the beauty of the high energy density, the abundance of enrichment services all over the world, you, you can have a series of sales pitches that are interesting. No, they, they, they go for safety because they think people will have to be reassured about safety. Well, hell, there, there is no such thing as, as 100% safe. It does not exist. Not even nature is 100% safe. Have an earthquake, you have <laughs> floods, you have heat waves, <laughs> all sorts of things. So it's, it's, it's a very interesting phenomenon. Now, how, how are you doing time-wise? Because I... No, we're good. How much time do you have? Like, I don't know. I have, I have like 15 minutes. So bring us forward a little bit so to... Yeah. To Laguna Verde, probably, which is the, the result of the preliminary studies that we did was that it looked interesting. And then there was a coincidence. We had a guy from Stanford who originally came from Harvard, I think, who was a specialist in decision analysis. And he came here and gave a lecture at CFE. He gave one of of his visiting lectures. And we thought it would be a good idea to have this group that we had established of operations research, which included a few nuclear people. Uh, uh, perhaps it would be interesting to, to absorb more of these decision, decision analysis techniques that sounded very good for the work, the planning activities of, of CFE. I mean, it's, it's interesting, it provides you with tools, uh, mathematical tools. That computers were not the same as we have today. We're talking 68. So one of the chores during the study was going to the computer, preferably around midnight, and you would get your work by four in the morning. <laughs> At that time, it was easier to process and we had a, a program of, you know, 5,000 cards or something like that, which took a long time to run, and an even long, longer time to correct. It was a different world. But the kind of results we got were marvelous. At any rate, the, the idea came that we should try to do something. So we spoke with this guy, we talked to him about the idea. And said, look, uh, if you want, uh, why don't you get in touch with the Stanford Research Institute? You can discuss with them and and establish a project. They would very gladly do a study. Stanford Research Institute is a (laughs) non-profit, but not cheap. (laughs) And in those days, we had money. It was not like today that uh, we were... the, the commission to leave the country for a public servant will have to be signed by the president. <laughs> so Mexico is going to isolate itself from the world. At least public servants will no longer be able to travel on their own, probably, but not, not, not on an official commission. Well... <laughs> I'm getting off the point. So we decided, we spoke with Stanford Research Institute. Uh, This guy, whose name was Ronald Howard, acted as as a consultant. And we did a very nice job. We produced a a system for uh, optimizing the expansion of the the power system. 
basically you, you have to put together different alternatives and evaluate the, the operation uh, by combining all sorts of things, uh, the probability of the plant being available, the probability of the transmission system working properly, a series of things, and, and it came out with the, with the not necessarily a formal optimum, but uh, the, the best solution, let's say. And we used that model to test the visibility of nuclear. Mm. And the net result was very interesting. Uh, one of the main reasons for looking into that is that CFE was accustomed to, analyze, to, to the analysis of, or the comparison of uh, the power plant fueled by oil mm. or a hydro. And that's relatively simple. But when we came to nuclear, people start saying, well, okay, but uh, nuclear, what, what's the local content? Uh, what, if you look at it positively, what possibilities uh, for the local industry to develop? So there is a whole series of uh, considerations that could not be taken into consideration in the planning system we had then. So we came up with, with a, a nice, uh, the, the one guy from, from Stanford was responsible for writing the program, which in those days were wrote in Fortran. Still today they use Fortran. <laughs> well, but, but you Just handle the it differently. <laughs> <laughs> and then you can buy the, the, the whole program, I mean, there are all sorts of things. But this program was used by many of the consultants that are in the electric power planning business, let's say. So the interesting thing was that uh, we concluded that if the price of oil in Mexico would be the price of high sulfur fuel oil in, in uh, New York Harbor, the nuclear solution would, would compete, would be cheaper. Not much, but it would be cheaper. So with that, we started convincing first CFE and then CFE, the, the couple of ministries. It went up to the president. The president said, yes, but not in my term. He was leaving. Yeah. So we, we did. No, no. I, 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 we convinced, well, we, I, I, I did not participate in that, in, in the talking with the president. I did talk with the next president. But the interesting thing is that we went ahead and something that was for, for the country in, in our position vis-a-vis -vis nuclear was, was never intended. I'm not sure it was a good idea. That was mine. I, I, I defended it and I worked it through. It didn't turn out to be as good as I thought it would, but at any rate, in principle, it was very good. Normally, uh, let's say, big utilities have a competent engineering system. Mm -hmm. And although they, they get contractors, they run the show. Mm -hmm and they do the, the licitation, the acquisition of, of parts. Procurement. The procurement, uh, making specifications, etc. So I convinced the system that we should do it that way. The first nuclear power plant that would be bought and built with had we selected a turnkey, probably the construction wouldn't have lasted that long. But I, I thought that the turnkey was not a very good idea because we, we were not going to learn anything. Mm. Whereas by doing this this way, we, we would learn a lot. And it was extremely interesting because we started uh, by, we, we did high consultants. Uh, 
there was a Mexican firm together with an American firm for the for the power system. There was another for the for the fuel and the nuclear power. And uh, we went ahead. We used uh, our Stanford program for the bid evaluation, mm. which was very interesting because we had bids for nuclear supply system, bids for for uh, turbine generator, and bids for the fuel, mm. and we combined them using our program to evaluate the different combinations. The Mitsubishi reactor with the general electric turbine, with fuel normally, the, the fuel, at the beginning they said they were going to bid for different reactors, for instance, that I think it was the Canadians who always speak too much, <laughs> or talk too much. The Canadians said that they were, they, they could bid for a, for a general electric or for a Westinghouse reactor. They had the know-how to make the fuel. So we said, okay, but finally it was, the, the, the fuel cycle was responsibility of the nuclear steam supply system supply. And the, the exercise came out very well. We, we, by making these combinations and matching them one against the other, for instance, we would take the Westinghouse reactor with the Siemens turbine generator and match it with the Westinghouse reactor and the uh, general electric turbine. And see which one came out the best? No. See, we, we would use <laughs> the expenditures on one of the alternatives as income for the other mm. to see which one, which combination got the highest, <coughs> the highest, what it would be, it could be present value, not exactly, but it could be the, I forgot the factors, one thing that is used in economics. A discount factor? It, it's something like that, the discount factor. Uh, I'm not so sure how you call it in English, but it, it was an interesting exercise. And at least one supplier went out of business out of, after that. The, the chief engineer of uh, the British company came to see me and I showed him the, the numbers and, the, and all, 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 all what we had done. And he said, yep, you're right. <laughs> We're never going to be able to make it. And they left the market. Interesting. So what happened was that uh, the combinations that, that won were GE, for combustion engineering for the nuclear steam supply system and Mitsubishi for the turbines. Mm. So we started negotiations and then the administration changed. Mm. And th that, that was when the president said, I'm not going to take the decision before the general administration. I will leave it to my successor. So by the time the new president took office, we had selected General Electric and, and uh, Mitsubishi. But then uh, it was discovered that uh, there were bribery issues involved. Mm. So we spoke with the new president. The new president authorized the project, but we had to redo the evaluation. Mm. And truly enough, the new evaluation was 3% lower. The new bids were 3% lower. <laughs> they took off the commission. <laughs> it was exactly the same, the same results, but the bids were 3% lower. It was lots of money. Yeah. <coughs> it's a big contract. And <coughs> we, we started, it was the first letters of intent, or, or actually, there was one contract. We signed in 73. And 
the first concrete in the first unit was in 75, I believe. And then we started making idiotic things. The, the project was still going on with a consultant, well, an architect engineer, working with CFE and with a Mexican engineering firm. But there were all sorts of complications. There was a change of uh, directors of CFE. Mm. And the new director came in and he was sensitized by our colleagues. The plant was the wrong type. It should, should have been a uh, candor reactor. It was located in Veracruz, where the Mexican oil wealth started. It was located on the fault. It was a series of, so the poor guy got frightened. The director general, who was a lawyer, he knew nothing about this, <laughs> he was a lawyer. And as a result, what was done to the Laguna Verde project was something that you should never do to a large project, which is stop and go and then change forces in the mid-time. They changed the, the engineering firm. They brought in a new one. This required, according to the American laws, a compensation for the company that was fired. So the price goes price up, was up. up enormously. <clears throat> and at the end came uh, Three Mile Island, so the whole philosophy about uh, pipe, whip, pipe, pipe whip was, was modified, so... The large all, brake look uh, to the small... All, all, the, all the pipes were... Oh, the water hammer? Have, or the no, no, water hammer is, is physics. Is, uh, no, the, what, the, the pipe is, is on the assumption that the large pipe that's carrying steam Yes. Would break for water. Ah, the large break. It would. It oh, would. Oh, it would reject and move. Or... The, it would break. Yes. And the and the the pipe would do an effect of a lash lash. A whiplash. A whiplash. Yeah. The whiplash effect of the of. So the the whole um, supporting system had to be reviewed, which was a big mistake because it created. The, the reactor was designed with the original uh, configuration of the configuration. pipes, yeah. So you start putting restraints and, and, and controls and whiplash uh, defenders, or how they call them. So the plant is a different thing. So when you start putting those things in and then try to get the small pipes, air conditioning, it's, it's a mess. We also will be faced with something that I think is pretty major and hasn't changed. I went to visit the construction site. Was they were installing inside the, of the reactor building, the, the reactor containment building, huge pipes for air conditioning. What is this? It's air conditioning. So I went to the. In those days, it was it was a Vasco. They had fire burns and all. So I said, "What? Why don't you use high velocity air conditioning? We don't talk about it. This is approved. You don't mess with things that are approved." With that question, I went to. He was the chief scientist or chief engineer. Then he became vice president for nuclear of G. Hey, Bert Wolf. I told him, he came up, don't touch it. It's licensed. You're an engineer for heaven's sake. Imagine the difference that, that we will have in, in, in a reactor building 
having pipes two inch or, or three inch pipes instead of this four feet by no no 10 feet by 20 feet square section uh, air conditioning uh, pipes he said yes you're absolutely right but if you want to go to the nrc for approval it may stop all the projects for for several years mm -hmm. then you would have interveners and you would have all sorts the germans told me the same thing it is it is approved don't touch it the french told me the same thing but the germans and the french have their own regulators yes that but, have but, their own culture and everything how come how come every single regulator has the same problem not exactly it is not exactly a problem of regulators it's a problem of technology and and philosophy of regulation which is pretty uniform uh, the nuclear energy agency of oecd has two groups one is the committee on uh, the safety of nuclear installations and the committee on uh, the regulatory activities of the member countries and they, they tend to work together and to have regulators working together on, on projects on physical projects to, to examine different phenomena and on, on regulatory practices so there is a tendency to have not uniformity but a certain homogeneity if you will on regulation but this this is changing now because of the smaller reactors and the mass produced reactors and all these things which is uh, an interesting future for nuclear is it changing though well it, it will for the time being the countries that are building nuclear power plants are building 1500 and 1600 megawatt units but the small reactors are coming are coming to land the soviets uh, have already i have i think one, one of the plants has already produced power it's, it's a relatively small barge mounted nuclear power plant 30 megawatts or so which is a very interesting concept because this you build in, in the factory and the new trend is to have modular reactors and also to open the door for new designs not everything would be boiling uh, i mean uh, light water reactors which is the dominant technology graphite moderated is dead except that you may come back with gas cooled reactors and, and that's an interesting concept because of the temperatures you can reach so the plants could be much more efficient but this trend is coming but again i i made a proposal my last meeting with the IAEA in 64, there was a meeting on small reactors. And I, I presented a, a paper suggesting that my mistake was to suggest that the agency could act as a broker. So I told them if the agency we lacked as a broker, then it can put together the demands of 100 countries for exactly the same type of reactor. Yes. So you would convert economies of scale mm -hmm. into mass into economies of mass production. Plus the fact that if these, if the plants are small, you can build them in a factory. Mm -hmm. Mainly in 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 a, in a yard when you build ships. But everybody went up my, up my throats. The guys from the from the engineering firms said, "But you are out of your mind. Each utility has its own basic design criteria." I said, "Well, that's that's the beauty of, of the thing I'm suggesting." Yeah, yeah. That's the problem we're trying to fix here. By by a, by a good Ford instead of a specially designed Rolls Royce. Said no, no, no! You don't know what you're talking about. 
Then my boss from the agency said, you're crazy. I mean, the agency acting as a broker for commercial interests, this is a no-no in, in, this, in this house. How do you do it? <laughs> so just something like that. Talking 64. In those days, nobody listened. <laughs> now the trend is that. That's the exact trend. 50 years later, that's the trend. Small reactors. But you, but you have to wonder why in the last 50 years, what has prevented that idea from surfacing and being implemented commercially? Well, in, in, in my view, it's the same original sin. I mean, the problem with Nuclear is and will continue to be, on the one hand, the, 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 this capital sin, the fact that the first mass application was the bomb, and second, the attitude of the nuclear industry. The show, when you show fear, even the dogs bite you. Right. And this is the case. But the other thing that is very important is that uh, I think, Ma well, Malkan is running very, <laughs> very difficult situations continuously, no matter what. So aside from the fact that uh, the weapons of mass destruction can be released and can do away with Malkan <laughs> easily, aside from that, what what is really amazing is the the way that climate change is being approached. It, I, I'm amazed because <laughs> the, the interruptible energy sources, non-firm energy sources, are not enough. You, 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 you can cover the earth with, with photovoltaics and, and uh, wind generators, you will not have enough power when you need it. No matter what, what people and politicians say, it's not possible. It is not physically possible. It's a question of adding, and, and, and you get numbers that don't match. So the only source that can really substitute fossil fuels is nuclear. And with, with simple things, nuclear can become, even without the, the breeder reactors, nuclear can become a, an, an infinite source. At, at present, the estimates of uh, getting a pound of uh, uranium from the seawater is like $200 or say $500, something like that. And the beauty of that is that once you match the, the technology, once you master the technology... It only goes down. It only goes down, and uranium, as, as a component of the Earth, continuously circulates. Uh, it may be expensive to get it, but it's an infinite source. And it's still relatively low as a function of the cost to deliver electricity from a nuclear power plant itself. It's a, that's the beauty of nuclear. And if you can if you can cut down the investment, which is due to the to the safety barriers, so this is why. But if the whole, let me ask you something, yeah? the safety barriers, it is built on this theory that the consequence of an accident is very high. Yeah. Why can't somebody demonstrate that the consequence of the accident isn't high and get relief from that safety paradigm? that drives cost. Well, <laughs> that's, that's engineering thought, not politician thought. But there's, there's a very interesting story on that. Uh, when the AEC was in process of deciding what to do with, uh, with uh, irradiated fuel, which is the nasty thing, you have to worry about it for, for hundreds of, of thousands of years. So they came up with solution. The beauty of radioactive material is that it is very easy to detect. You have a simple device that tells you who it is. You cannot detect it by smelling. <laughs> it doesn't look different. But with a simple device, you can detect it. 
So they said, we build the Fort Knox, we put all the material there, we put the soldier on the door. And somebody in his big wisdom decided to consult the National Science Foundation. <laughs> and they went to the National Science Foundation, and the National Science Foundation says, yes, that's okay, but can you tell us what will happen in 1,000 years? Will society 1,000 years from now will keep the guard at the door of the Fort Knox? And of course, he is not. But wait a minute, if you are seriously worried about that, how the hell do you use plastics? Or any heavy metals, but, or any heavy metals that we just... Well, heavy metals, but particularly poisonous metals. Yes. Poisonous chemicals, stable chemicals. Yes. That last infinity long. Last infinity and with, with the appropriate uh, uh, circulation patterns. For instance, the, the amount of arsenic in some waters is, is well above the, the drinkable limits. But the nuclear community who should know the best about these materials and understand the health effects, they don't feel that way. Everyone I talk to they says we need to it. dispose of it for a million years. It is our responsibility. Instead of comparing it to everything else society does and say, well, it is, it is a responsibility. I, the best solution is the Fort Knox. Right. That's very cheap, and, and with your detectors, you can always solve the problem if there is a, an escape. But the second best is long-term storage. But don't exaggerate. You have to demonstrate to the regulator that the thing will not move in a million years. Then you go to hell, compare it with other things. But the, the relative, this idea of comparing you remember the story of uh, this guy from MIT? He, he became very famous. The probabilistic study that showed that the risk of a nuclear accident was very small, but the consequences were enormous. Mm. The problem with that is that the interpretation that people took was not the probabilistic interpretation. Mm. So people become People are still frightened. I mean, take Fukushima. In Fukushima, the first thing they did, on the advice of my acquaintance in those days, uh, chairman, the chairman of the NRC, who went to Japan and said, if the Japanese are willing to move, I mean, to, to stay 10 miles from the plant, it's okay with them. I prohibit the American citizens to come closer than 50 miles to the plant because the dangers are enormous. What the hell? He doesn't know what he was talking about. But as a result of those considerations, they had to evacuate about 120,000 people. When everything came to census and they measured the radiation levels and all that, it would have been enough to evacuate, I think, about 30,000 people. Okay, there are limits, the, 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 the zones that have radiation, and it's best not to expose, to, not to be exposed to them. But it's not that bad. Radiation is a natural phenomenon. And, and, and this is uh, something that should be taken into consideration, mainly by the nuclear community, which are the first ones to, to be afraid. But you have, you have, Crazy things. There is a principle that man-made radiation cannot be disposed in the environment. Man-made radiation. When it's the same thing as the thing that's already in the environment. It's a physical thing. Yes, how come, so you just meant, you said Fort Knox is the best solution. Why isn't dilution the best solution? Just well, dilution, grind it up. because dilution is more complicated uh, simply because of the amount you need to dilute maybe too big. The ocean is pretty big. Yeah, but that's, that's how it started. But then it turned out that 
the, the canisters they used were not that resistant. And then the, the fission probes were escaping. And this is something that... But why not purposefully escape them? Why not actually... No, because, because there's no need for that. I mean, you can keep them until they decay. No, you cannot warrant that, that uh, people will be uh, caring for them a million years from now. But if, if the civilization is comparable to what we have now, they will know what the dangers are, and they will keep them safe. Yeah. If they become crazy, well, they will anyway die for other reasons. But the important thing is that for, for some reason, the nuclear community is not willing to fight for principles. The most important one is that let's be relative. Okay, it is dangerous. We can measure more or less what, what the dangers are. Let's be rational about it. But you've had experience now, and you've seen everyone, met everyone in the nuclear community throughout your career. What this is this is a problem that has been going on forever. Has anyone ever tried to reshape the culture of the nuclear community itself? Or is there a country where it's different? Is there a country where the nuclear engineers there talk differently, feel differently? Well, there, there, are, there are countries that have a successful program. Finland is one example. South Korea, I think, is also a good example. Uh, I don't know what their perspective is because the communication difficulties are unbelievable. You think they speak English, but they don't. <laughs> And they were, I speak English, but uh, with, with, with the Mexican origin, so my, my English is not perfect. But you have tried to talk to a Japanese or a Korean. Some of them speak beautifully, but, but they are the exception. The Chinese, for instance, have a, I think, have a pretty objective look for nuclear, of you, for culture. And well, the Russians, the only trouble with Russia is they belong to the world because the original concept in Russia is that maintenance is a, is, is a stupid uh, term. You build a plant to produce copper, and after, uh, after it, it's useless, you build a new one. You don't do maintenance. If you if you fly on a on an aeroflot plane, have you learned that? On what? Have you flown on, of a, course. on, a, on an aeroflot plane? On, on which type of plane? On the on the Russian plane. On the Russian plane, so no, no. It's an experience. <laughs> the, the 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 thing flies, but probably now they have changed. But I remember the first time I went. You wouldn't believe the, the, the facilities, the, the, the toilets on an airplane. The, the seating arrangements, they change. Yeah. But they, the concept was maintenance. <laughs> and with nuclear, they had to change some things. Do you see, um, as we wrap up here, mm -hmm. do you see, do you see a bright future looking forward for the nuclear community? You mentioned some of the things happening around small modular. And do you, do you see, do you anticipate things to change? Yes. And, and at what period, at what rate do you think things will change? I know. I think it depends very much on the manifestations of, of climate change. If, if if these things that are happening already, um, look. The problem I have with climate change is that I don't believe in the IPCC. Right. I think they are crazy. This this idea of if if we limit the carbon content of the atmosphere to four hundred and fifty parts per million, we'll be okay. To hell with it. I mean, how how can they imagine such thing? Look, I think the future of nuclear is unavoidable. I don't see a viable society without nuclear. It may take very long. It may take uh, several hard uh, events. 
but unless something, uh, some new form of energy is, is discovered, which would be great. For instance, uh, non-heat produced, uh, heat used uh, fusion. But right now, with the, with the present scientific and technological um, tools, no way. Only nuclear. And the other thing that they should is if, if we keep putting things into the atmosphere, it, it, it's going to collapse. It, 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 to me, it's extraordinarily simple. You have a skin of about 100 kilometers of an Earth that has about 6,000 kilometers of radius. So it's 100 kilometers compared to 6,000. And in that small <laughs> skin, you're throwing all sorts of things that, that, that change its nature. And the other important point is that the, the amount of energy received from the sun in that skin is enormous. It's equivalent to, to one day of energy absorption by the, by the atmosphere is equivalent to the whole conservation of energy of the Earth for one year or more. I don't remember the numbers exactly, but it's amazing. You look at those numbers and it's really amazing. So just imagine this, this small skin with its characteristics completely deformed, absorbing that amount of energy. It can be a huge hurricane continuously. That's one possibility. The other is that it becomes seriously unstable and we are left without oxygen. <laughs> I mean, it's fantasizing, but... So to do something that will avoid putting debris into the atmosphere is really important. And I think at one point in time, mankind is going to realize that you have to quit uh, being frightened put the local community to work and then be more objective about, about things. Juan, I've been Chad Sartman. Thank you so much for your time. My pleasure.